On this Tuesday night, the world is watching this city, London, after a day of some unprecedented political drama. The eyes to the right, 202. The nose to the left, 432. So the nos have it, the nos have it. Theresa May loses a critical Brexit vote big time. Now her country's exit from the EU is in question for government's future up in the air. And UK citizens living in the EU deserve clarity on these questions as soon as possible. Why no one seems to know what will happen next. We believe it is inhumane and inappropriate. Ottawa appeals for clemency for a Canadian on death row in China. But as both countries ratchet up the tension, could their complicated relationship cost him his life? Is this the best a man can get? And a razor company's edgy ad takes on masculinity. Boys are the boys. And sparks a backlash. Men are fed up with this. They are fed up with being told how awful we are all day. Is it controversial social commentary, savvy marketing, or both? This is The National. It was the largest defeat for a sitting government in British history. Theresa May's Brexit deal is dead. Now her government is set to face a no-confidence motion. Tomorrow, she will find out if her days here at 10 Downing could be coming to an end. This is all uncharted territory. Tonight, we're here in London to guide you through it. It is clear that the House does not support this deal, but tonight's vote tells us nothing about what it does support. The Prime Minister soldiered on in the House despite the stinging final tally. 202 votes in favour, 432 against. Explosive reaction from a nation on tenderhooks as a pivotal moment passed. Their future with the European Union now more uncertain than ever. And from the EU, a more pointed reaction. I take note with regret of the outcome of the vote in the House of Commons this evening. The EU commissioner tweeted, I urge the UK to clarify its intentions as soon as possible. Time is almost up. That is a not-so-subtle nod to the March 29th deadline when the actual exit is supposed to get underway. But let's begin at Westminster, the scene of heavy drama today rarely witnessed in the Commons. Thomas Degla takes us through the vote. Free papers, free standards. The build-up to this vote has been huge. Free papers. The stakes enormous for the future of everyone in this country. Still, with that weight on their shoulders, most MPs seemed to make an easy choice. That is a monumental leap into the unknown that I will not make. Labour will vote against this deal tonight. Yeah. Even Conservatives had no trouble blasting their leader's plan. It is our duty to vote against it. Especially the so-called Northern Ireland backstop, which could keep the UK tied to European trade rules for years. We cannot now Treat the public as idiots. The decision of the joint At the heart of the Rock vote is this 585-page EU divorce agreement, supported by Conservative MP George Freeman. This is a sort of political civil war, and I, I'm voting tonight because whatever else I think, this has got to end. Tonight, Theresa May received a warm welcome, perhaps out of pity, ahead of a big defeat. This is an historic decision that will set the future of our country for generations. MPs left the chamber to supposedly vote in private, yet some posted pictures to show the staggering size of the crowd voting no. The eyes to the right, 202. The nose to the left, 432. Yes, it's a brutal beating for May, but she had a speech ready just for this. To listen to the British people, who want this issue settled. May says she'll meet with MPs from all sides to find a way forward, but not so fast. I have now tabled a motion of no confidence in this government. That vote will come tomorrow. This House is still a mess. And so, Thomas, a lot of the analysis out of the UK tonight seems to suggest that Theresa May might just survive that no confidence vote tomorrow. Walk us through why that is. It comes down to numbers again. The opposition just doesn't have enough votes 
to bring down the government, especially when you consider the conservatives' allies, the Democratic Unionists, have said they're not going to vote to bring down the government. The only real effect of today's result is that this country is no closer to the exit. In fact, it may be further away. There's no clear path out of the EU. There's no majority in Parliament mm -hmm. one way or another. This is just a continuation of the same Tory infighting that led this country down the Brexit path in the first place. The previous Prime Minister lost his job. This one may have lost control of Brexit today. Uh, Theresa May back there has a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. A long night ahead of her. Thomas, thanks very You're much. You're welcome. Across the UK, people were glued to the vote. Large crowds made their way to Parliament Square to be on the scene as their future was plotted, only to find it more uncertain than ever. Please give up a hold. The police were ready for trouble, ready to separate what they feared might be thousands of protesters clashing for hours. Like most Brexit predictions, though, it was wrong. There was noise and bluster, but the defeat for May's plan was so punishing and it came so fast. So the news have it, clear the lobby. Those gathered in Parliament Square barely had time to react. Not exactly what you would call a squeaker. Those standing here to watch what they call their Brexistential vote were mostly from the Remain camp. No confidence in the government. I just was watching you don't as you were listening and your slow <laughs> claps. What's now, what's going through your head now? The um, now. What the I'm world? thinking towards the future and the people's vote. What? We must get a people's vote. But forgive my ignorance, didn't you have that the first time? We had a people's vote, but it was flawed. It's completely irrational that it, you should have one vote. You then need to take stock of the situation. The original vote didn't even ask on what terms we were to leave. Uh, so it's absolutely essential that this goes back to the people. These two had planned to come to the square to watch, but it was all over by the time they arrived. 432 to 202. Others stay put in the pub, clutching both booze and smartphones. Some glued far above it all. So I'm um, sitting here at 35,000 feet, watching the Brexit vote via YouTube. And I've got to say, it's just, like, technology is amazing when you realize that you can actually do that and see the, the catastrophic defeat of the British government. He's getting perhaps a little bit ahead of himself because back on Earth, into at least two opposing in Corey Young's living room in Scotland, the realization it's more complicated than that. I think the, there's a lot of fatigue going on right now, um, but I think a lot of people just want it to be over with. And we don't really have that right now. No, it's definitely not over. The cold setting in, the smaller group of Brexiteers wandered away knowing nothing has been sorted. Personally, I'm glad. How come? Because I didn't respect May's deal in the first place. Isn't it weird in a way that people on the leave and remain side are both happy tonight? I don't think it's uh, weird at all. I think it's an obvious expectation. We wanted a, a real proper Brexit. We didn't want what May came up with. What are you going to get now, though? Who knows? I never worked since I was 25. Do you know why I didn't work since I was 25? Because I became a millionaire at 25. Oh, good for you. And this is how we left them tonight, barking at each other on the street, settling absolutely nothing, gearing up for just more arguments ahead. So high emotion tonight, but the day will break on a hazy future. There's no deal. But Brexit is still on track to commence March 29th. Assuming May does win the confidence of the House, what could happen next? Let's run down the options. May could go back to the EU. She could ask them for a better deal for Britain, concessions that would need to be swiftly negotiated before the deadline. Or she could ask to have that deadline pushed back. It's an unlikely option, but May could roll the dice by calling a snap election to try to gain more support in Parliament or another referendum, something she's vowed not to do. Failing that, Britain could leave on schedule but with no deal. For a sense on how this all might end, we've turned to Anand Menon, an esteemed professor of politics and foreign affairs. 
He also heads an initiative called the UK in a Changing Europe. So Anna Menon, thank you for helping us out here. We know there are a number of scenarios that are possible. Mm -hmm. What do you think is most likely? I think the key to British politics at the moment is that all the outcomes are quite unlikely. One of them will happen. It is far too soon to say yet because actually we're just starting that process of parliamentarians having to make choices. They've said they don't want the deal. Now they've got to decide what they do want. And I think the three options are general election, unlikely because the Conservatives don't want one. Another referendum, unlikely because there's no majority in there. No deal, unlikely because there's absolutely no majority in there. What we have to wait and see is how MPs start to evolve in their thinking and if something becomes more popular amongst them. It's been interesting watching this country tie itself in knots and then looking at the 27 countries of the EU speak with sort of one cohesive voice. So looking at that block, do you think there's any incentive for them to open up renegotiation. I think the EU will be looking at this thinking, should we waste time and energy trying to make concessions given the scale of the defeat? So I think the scale of the defeat matters in that way. Ultimately, I think what's gonna happen is we'll have the vote tomorrow, Theresa May will talk to party leaders, then she'll go to Europe and say, I reckon if we can do this and this, I might be able to squeak this through. At that point, then I think the European Union will talk to her, but not before. What is there to be afraid of with a hard Brexit? Because you hear so many people say they are afraid of it. Well, this is a question that's really misunderstood. In the event of no deal, the issue isn't trading on World tra Trade Organization terms. The issue is that the legal infrastructure that governs our interactions with Europe, whether it's flights, whether it's travel, whether it's trade, whether it's medical certification, ceases to exist. All of a sudden, we're in a legal vacuum. At that point, you're going to have chaos, at least in the short term, and that's the real danger of no deal. Okay, we'll see what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So we're expecting another day of frustrating political plays here in London tomorrow, beginning, of course, with that no confidence vote. Yeah, no kidding, Adrian. Busy times ahead. Uh, and we are going to catch up with you again within the hour with more on tonight's drama on our moment. You bet. Now, it's not just the UK struggling to find its way out of a political quagmire tonight. Canada's relationship with China is deteriorating as the Trudeau government tries to get clemency for convicted drug trafficker Robert Schellenberg. There is a very real chance he will be executed after being hastily retried and sentenced to death. All this as two other Canadians sit behind bars in China, accused of violating that country's national security. Their detention, apparent retaliation for the arrest of China's Huawei executive, Meng Wanzhou. Evan Dyer walks us through this deepening diplomatic crisis with Canadians caught in the middle. Canada has asked for clemency for Robert Schellenberg. We have already spoken with China's ambassador to Canada uh, and requested clemency. A tough ask as the relationship only seems to get worse, evidenced today by China accusing the Prime Minister of malicious slander. And after Canada changed its travel advisory, China has responded in kind, warning of the arbitrary detention of a Chinese citizen. Meanwhile, Schellenberg's family can only watch. Foreign Affairs Minister Christopher Freeland spoke to his father today. It was a very emotional conversation for him. He and his family have asked the government to do all it can to save their son from death row. But that may be an uphill battle. We learned today that two Chinese-Canadian dual citizens have been executed for drug crimes in China in recent years, suggesting that even in normal times, it's hard to stop a Chinese execution. Prime Minister Harper wrote a personal letter to Xi Jinping asking for clemency, and they proceeded anyway the next day uh, with the execution. Canada's then ambassador says the only way forward is to get other allies on side. I think. I would hope that the government will continue with this strategy because we have to attract as much international attention to this. China is concerned about its reputation and it may uh, make them think twice. A message seemingly echoed by the foreign affairs minister today. We now have Germany, France, the Netherlands, the EU, the United States, the UK, Australia, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia publicly coming out and speaking against these arbitrary detentions. None of which has been lost on China. I have noted that some Canadian officials have been going all out to encourage more of their allies to side with them, said Hua, but these several countries cannot represent the international community. I think we need to persuade China that it is not in their long-term interest to detain foreigners. 
right, for whatever reason. So far, the Canadian government has stopped short of the Prime Minister directly reaching out to China's president about Schellenberg or the other two detained Canadians. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, Canada is caught in a very different sort of crossfire in the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. One of the Kremlin's most prominent propagandists is making an incredible claim that Ottawa is being manipulated from the inside by Nazi-loving Ukrainian nationalists. It's on Russian TV. Chris Brown shows us. Dmitry Kiselov has a special place among Russian propagandists. He's the only Russian journalist sanctioned by Canada for disseminating what the government considers to be Kremlin lies. And for his first primetime show of 2019, he zeroed in on Canada and its million and a half strong Ukrainian community. They're the ones that dictate Canadian foreign policy, said the woman who's listed as a director of the Russian Congress of Canada, a group seen as being very pro-President Vladimir Putin. Kiselov's program visited a Ukrainian cemetery in Oakville. It's filled with the graves of Ukrainians who fought with the Nazis against Russia during the Second World War. <laughs> which appeared to be the central theme, that Ukrainian Nazi descendants Justin Trudeau hold political power in Canada. Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Friedland and Liberal MP Boris Shiznevsky and his family, dressed in their traditional Ukrainian vushivankas, were singled out. And it was seen as a sign of, oh my goodness, uh, see, we told you, they're infiltrating, they're, you know, it's just ludicrous. Controlling Ukraine is central to Putin's goal of making Russia a global superpower again, says Shuznevsky. Without Ukraine, Russia ceases to be an empire. The anti-Ukrainian rhetoric has intensified here ever since Russia's navy shot at and then captured Ukrainian warships and their crews near the disputed Crimean Peninsula. Now, with Ukrainian elections just around the corner, the Kremlin's propaganda machine may be turning its focus to Ukraine's strongest allies. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. And also tonight on The National, we are following a deadly and terrifying militant attack on a hotel complex in Kenya. The siege started with an explosion targeting vehicles outside, followed by a suicide bombing in the hotel lobby. Then, armed gunmen stormed the complex and started shooting. Those who could escape ran for their lives. Many of the injured had to be rescued. Trust me. It's not your day today, Mama. Not today, my sister. Today, you're not dying. You're not dying today. All right, medic! After eight hours, government officials said the situation was finally under control, but gunfire and explosions continued. More than a dozen people have been killed, among them an American and a British citizen. Somali militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility. In that terrible Ottawa bus crash, the Department of National Defense confirmed today that four armed forces members and five of its civilian workers were among those hurt. On top of that, three people, all public servants, were killed when that double-decker bus plowed into a shelter. Investigators are still trying to figure out what caused that crash. The Saudi teenager who fled her family is starting her new life in Canada with hired security. The settlement agency, working with Rahaf Mohammed in Toronto, says there have been numerous threats made against her on social media, but speaking through an interpreter today, and despite the security concerns, she says she counts her blessings. I am one of the lucky ones. I know that there are unlucky women who disappeared after trying to escape. The 18-year-old added she has no regrets. Still ahead on the national, keeping more than 600 British MPs in check is no easy gig. And so the hard work of the common speaker shouting them all down could not be ignored today. You're going to want to stick around for that. Yeah, indeed. Plus, goodbye, Dolly. The Great White Way pays tribute to the legendary Carol Channing. And is Gillette's controversial new ad about making better men or just making money? Bullying. The Me Too movement against sexual Toxic harassment. Masculinity. Attention is the oxygen of marketing. If you want to be out there, you have to pick a side. We'll be the men.
bullying. The Me Too violence. movement against Toxic sexual harassment. masculinity. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. A lot of buzz over this new ad from Gillette. They're selling razors, sure, but also a changing idea of masculinity. And it's that second part, depending on who you ask, it's either a sign of the times or an insult to men. So can a company turn a profit wading into something as controversial as this? Eli Glasner takes a look. Is this the best a man can get? The new ad cuts to the idea of what it means to be a man, it's over. tweaking Gillette's tagline to take a stand change. against toxic no masculinity. No Online, the ad quickly racked up millions of views thing. and a backlash. Actor James Woods tweeted about the razor company jumping on the, quote, men are horrible campaign. In London, TV personality Piers Morgan added his voice. Men are fed up with this. They are fed up with being told how awful we are all day. Mm. We're fed up with it, sorry. Soon customers who don't like mixing politics with smooth chins started chucking their razors. Tension is the oxygen of marketing. If you want to be out there, you have to pick a side. And that's just the Former way ad executive Tony Chapman design. says Gillette expected a backlash. He says the way the ad confronts the brand's history is brilliant. You know, cleat shaven faces, your, your pathway to having sex and getting kissed by a beautiful woman. They felt they had permission to play there. And in doing so, they're taking a very hard pivot for the brand. And with that, comes both risk and reward. It's pretty smartly done, eh? Like it Author really Rachel Giza is skeptical when companies take up a social cause, but she says the one they've chosen speaks volumes. The fact that this ad exists suggests that this critique um, and rethink about masculinity um, has become so much a part of the cultural conversation that a company thinks that an ad like this will resonate with men. Gillette is just the latest in a string of brands to challenge customers. When Nike launched a campaign around NFL player Colin Kaepernick, customers set their shoes on fire, but... We followed their share price, their sales, uh, the, the affinity for the brand, all of these things have been very positive since they made that move. Believe in something. In fact, in the quarter Nike released the Kaepernick ads, sales rose 10 percent. To act the right way. And while the new Gillette campaign is rubbing some men the wrong way, Chapman says the company is actually targeting women who make the majority of household purchases. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Now let's pick up on that, about that female purchasing power. Women in Canada account for 60% of primary shoppers, and women drive up to 80% of all consumer spending. That includes their influence over other people's purchases. Now it's worth mentioning that Gillette has been steadily losing its market share from 70% to less than half. It's partly because they're now competing with shaving club subscriptions, for one. And more men are keeping their beards. More men, uh, not all of them, though. Next on The National. As deadly as smoking and increasingly common in Canada, Joanna Romiliotis begins a series here on The National about loneliness and how to fight it. Plus, saying farewell to Carol Channing after a lifetime of laughs. What is it about being on stage that, that, that keeps you going? Uh, there's no other excuse for my existence. <laughs> <laughs> I have no choice. I just have two friends, but I don't I don't tell them about the stuff. Remember people used to whisper cancer? Yeah. I don't even know if loneliness is is whispered. Sometimes I can go two, three weeks without a phone call even. The answer is blowing in the wind. Those are three faces of loneliness. And we're going to explore their stories because it's more than just a feeling we sometimes have in our lowest moments. It's been described as an epidemic and it is killing us. Feelings of loneliness have been linked to a higher risk for depression, anxiety, dementia, heart disease, and diabetes. Put plain and simple, you're more likely to die. It's the equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. The percentage of Canadians living alone has been climbing for decades. Now it's 28%. And one in five Canadians identify themselves as lonely. That last number is important because loneliness affects the young and the old, those married and single. And the feeling itself is the problem, insidious and invisible. Joanna Romiliotis gives us a glimpse into this quiet gray world 
and the people who are fighting to escape it. In the noise of childhood, loneliness can be so quiet. Homestead Elementary School in Brampton. Every month here, all the kids gather to celebrate each other. On this day, there's also a surprise. Hello, everyone. My name is Trinity, and I'm here today to talk about some of my personal stories of anxiety, depression, and bullying. A 12-year-old visitor talks about her struggle to make friends and something profoundly simple that helped. A friendship bench. You may have heard of it. It's a place where a child can take a seat and send the silent signal they need a friend. You're going to have the bench placed permanently in our atrium. Yay! Angelo Cariati is the vice principal here. It doesn't feel good to be lonely. So we want to give the children the tools to seek that out and put themselves in the other person's shoes. How would I feel? How might I feel if that was me sitting alone on the bench or alone in the schoolyard? Childhood. It's easy to assume it's carefree. But hundreds of schools around the world have one of these. We set up a camera to capture the unspoken stories, the ones kids rarely talk about until they're asked. I was very lonely because I had no one to play with outside. So I thought like someone will come help me if I sat on the bench. It doesn't take long before someone does and before it's clear that Roshana Jakaran's sense of solitude runs deeper. It feels very like lonely and I don't feel like I belong sometimes. Yeah. And describe it to me. What does it feel like when you're feeling lonely? I feel like sad. Sometimes I feel like people don't care about me. It's revealing and heart-wrenching. This from a 10-year-old who does have friends and yet already feels how fleeting these moments of connection can be, how she already treasures them. The hardest part is when I'm sad and I got no one to be with me. The simplicity and the complexity of a child's developing emotions can be surprising. So is what they carry alone. I just have two friends. Mm -hmm. their, their name is Ronik and Isha. They're my best friends. Mm -hmm. So they never be rude to me. They're like, they support me too a lot, but I don't, I don't tell them about the stuff. Sukaran Pander doesn't tell them about the moments he says he spends crying alone. He was one of the first kids to sit down on the bench. We can sit here, and some student can come and help us. Like, if you're crying like so badly, mm -hmm. you can get calmed down, and yeah, you can tell her your story, whatever happened. And just take a look at what does happen. This is the first time he's told anyone, other than his parents that he's been bullied since the beginning of the school year. Did you talk to him about it? I said stop, it doesn't Okay, if they bother you to lie, you can just tell Why do you talk to him, teacher? Not only did he make a friend... We told Cariati about that moment. It was one of those things where you couldn't have planned that. Um, it's a child who instantly felt a connection with, the, with what came out of the bench. So now I know as an educator that, wow, that's great, we do have a tool there, but now I need to follow up to make sure that he's going home and feeling safe and coming back to school and feeling safe. Extraordinary what a moment can reveal when there's a place to see it. It's so shameful. And it makes you feel vulnerable. Up, 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 up. 
sometimes I have a tendency to feel disconnected and not part of any one community or tribe. One. A tribe, a place to belong. Two. Marcy O'Connor may find it Seven. here at a Navy base in Montreal. You're all there for the same reason. You're all wearing the same uniform. You're all eating at the same time. You're all participating in the same task. I find something really comforting in that. This may not look like comfort, a grueling test to see if she has what it takes to get into the Navy. But in the drills and demands, Marcy can see it. A place for her, a seat at the table of her life. That was the tough one. <laughs> it starts by breaking the stigma. Remember, people used to whisper cancer? Yeah. I don't even know if loneliness is, is whispered. Like, I don't even know if it's there yet. Marcy says ever since she can remember, she's felt a separateness. A child of divorce and now divorced too. There was no one moment more like a collection of broken threads that wove into a yearning. Marcy moved to Quebec from Toronto when she got married. Life with kids got busy. She drifted away from old friends, and two years ago, when the marriage ended, she lost the community that came with it. I lost a sense of my identity in a way. I wasn't really sure who I was or who I was going to be who I was connected to, who I could reach out to. <laughs> a busy life suddenly okay. got quieter. And as the outlines of her new life in her 40s emerged, so did empty spaces and a sense of guilt. I'm not alone, right? Like I have my mom and my brother and I have my kids. In spite of having them in my life, I still feel lonely. Loneliness is defined as a state of mind, a state of soul, and why people can feel lonely even when they're not alone. And as Marcy turned inward, the questioning became less about why and more about now what. <laughs> the changes seem subtle. How old was he when you got him? Marcy used to walk her dog alone. <laughs> now she takes her to a dog park to find people to talk to. A freelance writer, she's used to working from home. Have you heard it all from that? Now she's landed a longer contract, and that means going to the office every day. Some of the feedback's really interesting and helpful. I don't Developing some of work phrases. relationships that already feel less transient. It's all deliberate and liberating. As she exposes her loneliness, she diminishes the pain tangled in it. I won't try to push it away or question it or feel embarrassed or ashamed of it. And I just let it sit there and see where it takes me to. And it wouldn't have taken me to the Navy if I hadn't just sat with that feeling for a little bit. The Navy may be the most life-altering with its construct of unity, of home. Marcy passed that first test okay, I go. and got one exhausted step closer. The quiet can be unbearable, so Melvina Alderson sings it away. We've never kissed. Well, it's like you're not alone, and singing is one of the best ways of getting rid of depression. The answer is blowing in the wind. If you can sing along with it, it'll bring you out of anything. Melvina is 73 and lives alone with her solitude. You're always feeling lonely when you're by yourself. You're always eating alone. You're always spending the evening alone. When you get through that door, there's nobody here. Loneliness, for older people especially, can feel like the world is busy moving past you, that it doesn't occur to anyone to stop. <laughs> Melvina copes no. by making light of it. Sometimes I can go two, three weeks without a phone call even. There. My daughter and I were talking the other night. There she says, 
I'm just going to have a shower. Then I'll call you. Did you see the date on that? No. Anyways, it's a couple of days ago. I'm still waiting for that phone call. <laughs> but she was too tired. I know that that's why she didn't call me back. She went right to bed. But with, with Carol, she's phones. I know it's there. Good morning, Carol. Good morning, Lady Melvina. How are you? Very good. How are you? That call Melvina mentioned with a volunteer named Carol. It's a lifeline. I look forward to that phone call. <laughs> Matter of fact, they know downstairs. I go downstairs for breakfast every morning. On Thursdays, I have my alarm set for 920. I got to go upstairs. I got my conference call. <laughs> you said you went to see your doctor this week. So how did that go? Okay, it wasn't the flu I had. I have bronchitis. That's, that's something I was concerned about because you were saying you felt last week like you were actually fighting for every breath, and I did not like that at all. Carol Bailey is with a home health care <laughs> company that checks in on lonely clients. For sure. <laughs> She's often the only call they can count on. Good hearing you, my friend. We'll talk again soon. I noticed that a lot of it was just chit-chat. Yes. <laughs> And that's really what it is. We don't try, it's a companion call. So you're talking like you're talking to a friend. So we, we go into whatever the mood is for that day. But that call is only half an hour once a week. And there are so many hours to fill. Melvina has limited mobility and she races to fill them all by volunteering anywhere she can. These are five dollars. The annual poppy stand at a nearby mall is one of her favorites because the shifts can be 12 hours long. Have a good day, dear. Melvina has outlived partners and a son. I lost my wife uh, a few months ago. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. There's time here to connect, even if it's over losses. It does help with loneliness. When you see that somebody else is lonely, it helps by uh, saying, well, yeah, I'm here. I know what you're going through, but, you know, and you feel good, too. Okay, okay you have a great day. Okay. A moment like that, it's what keeps her going. And so she waits for the next one. Joanna okay, no. Rumeliotis, CBC News, Brampton, Ontario. A year ago, the British government appointed its first Minister of Loneliness. And tomorrow, we're going to show you one of the many programs it's launched. At the center of it, the Royal Mail. It's trusted, its mail carriers know their neighborhoods, and that makes them ideal messengers of solace for the solitary. It's a very special delivery tomorrow on The National. And next on the program, changing attitudes on and off the ice. An NHLer reaches out to a young player who faced racial slurs during a game. My grandparents thought it would be different <laughs> when, you know, when I'm this age. All I can hope for is, you know, my kids and my kids' kids to live in, in a world that um, this stuff isn't happening still. But first, the lights on Broadway will be briefly dimmed tomorrow night in honor of theater legend Carol Channing. She died early this morning at her home in California. A kiss on the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. Channing rose to fame in 1949 when she landed the role of Laura Lee in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Hello, Harry, well, hello, Louis. But it was her portrayal of matchmaker Dolly in Hello, Dolly that came to define her career. She won a Tony Award for it in 1964. If you want to be a success in anything, just stick to it. And she followed that advice to the letter. Channing would reprise the role of Dolly more than 5,000 times over the next three decades. Look at the old girl now, Janet. Her last national tour was in 1996, when she was in her mid-70s. Dolly marinated inside me during those years, and I didn't know I was thinking about her all the time, but I was. In film, too, Channing saw success, earning an Oscar nomination for Thoroughly Modern Millie. And she also guest starred in dozens of TV shows, but she always came back to Dolly. To be back home where I belong. Channing was 97.
Ask any hockey-loving kid, there's nothing like watching your NHL heroes on home ice. But for these kids, last night's Washington Capitals game was extra special. They were invited by the team after bravely standing up for one of their own in the face of intolerance. When one of these kids was subjected to racial insults and mockery on the ice, his teammates would have none of it. And as Paul Hunter reports, that courage made them heroes to the Caps. Let's go, Cavs, baby, Cavs! Oh, Game night in Washington, D.C. Capitals versus Blues, with fans pouring in. Go, Cavs! And while Caps placards and jerseys are, as ever, all the rage, check these fans with those buttons and that T-shirt. A hockey stick crossing out a single ugly word, racism. A team of Bantam players from Maryland invited to this game by the Capitals because of what happened at one of their games last month. In Pennsylvania, opposing players shouted racial taunts and made monkey sounds aimed at one of the players from Maryland, Divine Apollon, 13 years old, targeted for the color of his skin. I read the story um, and, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty sad to read. It prompted Capitals player Devontae smith Pelly to bring Devine's team to D.C. so he could offer up some hard-fought wisdom. Maybe I could talk to him one-on-one -on -one and um, share some of uh, my experiences with him. Indeed, smith Pelly, born in Toronto and last year a Stanley Cup winner, has his own tale of racial taunting in the NHL in Chicago last February. They were escorted out of the arena getting involved with Smith Pelly and players. A couple guys are, you know, telling me to go play basketball and yeah, I don't know if you saw the footage, but I was pretty upset and confronted them and it left Smith Pelly determined to always battle back on this. The message he'd soon give to Divine, don't let those small-minded people um, you know, kind of try and bring you down. And so to last night. It's with Pelly fires. Kick save Allen. While he skated up a storm, Divine was the star of the stands, featured on NBC's broadcast of the game, and then afterward in hockey heaven. He and his teammates were brought to the Caps dressing room in awe. Can I just say it's an honor to meet you? Yeah, thank you. Nice meeting you, too. Thank you. Autographs for all, but for Divine, some private words of encouragement from Smith Pelly. Grateful for the goodwill, Divine told us, truth is, he wonders whether this world will ever get past the ugliness of racism. That I'm not sure, but hopefully. Cross your fingers. And so he does. The Capitals ended up losing the game last night, but in their dressing room, nothing but winners. And what do you guys say? Thank you. Thank you. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Up next on The National, calling the House to order, unlike anything we see in our parliament, the speaker who couldn't go unnoticed is our moment. The eyes to the right, 202, the nose order. So if you were watching the Brexit vote in the British Parliament today, it was impossible not to notice how much work the speaker was doing. Brexit has a habit of bringing out the worst in British MPs. They're always an unruly bunch. But the speaker, John Burko, kind of has it all. The moral indignation of a schoolmaster, the light speed elocution of an auctioneer, and the bellow of a raging grizzly bear. His control over the commons is tonight's moment. Order! 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 I know what I'm doing. The key point is persistence. If the honourable gen order, order. If the honourable gentleman wishes to press his amendment, he is entitled to do so. But, oh yes, he is. Oh yes, he is. I'll be the judge of that. Order. The house must calm itself. Zen. Restraint. Patience. Order. People talk about respect in this house, but there's a minister of the crown shouting. 
Stop it. You're capable of much better than that. This matter or dare, I'm not interested in people chuntering from a sedentary position to no obvious benefit or purpose. I'm ruling on the matter and I require no assistance in the process of doing so. Division! Clear the lobby! Yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, so he may be uh, he may be a new face and a new voice for a lot of Canadians. Not here. He is known for infuriating members of Parliament. And there was a Guardian article recently that said he has inspired more fear, more anger, and more adoration than any other speaker in recent history. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Well, I, I, I find him very entertaining. Um, but the theater of it all, right? I mean, boy, that is really something. I guess. Given the stakes of the matter, we should only expect things to get more and more uh, animated over the next little while. And don't think he doesn't enjoy it. That is The <laughs> National for Tuesday, January 15th. Good night. Good night.